This podcast is supported by Progressive, a leader in RV insurance. RVs are for sharing adventures with family, friends, and even your pets. So if you bring your cats and dogs along for the ride, you'll want Progressive RV insurance. They protect your cats and dogs like family by offering up to $1,000 in optional coverage for vet bills in case of an RV accident, making it a great companion for the responsible pet owner who loves to travel. See Progressive's other benefits and more when you quote RV insurance at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Pet injury is an additional coverage and subject to policy terms. Next up on the Mutual Audio Network, fiction from our future. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Chapter 6 of 19 Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Expendables You see my problem, Professor? Tony Carmen held his pinkly manicured, flashly ringed hands wide. I saw his problem and it was warmly embarrassing. Really, Mr. Carmen, I said, this isn't the sort of thing you discuss with a total stranger. I'm not a doctor, not of medicine anyway, or a lawyer. They can't help me. I need an operator in your line. I work for the United States government. I can't become involved in anything illegal. Carmen smoothed down the front of his too tight midnight blue suit and touched the diamond sticking in his silver tie. You can't, Professor Vanetti. Ever hear of the Mafia? I've heard of it, I said uneasily. An old fraternal organization, something like the Moose or Rosicrucians, founded in Sicily. It allegedly controls organized crime in the U.S., but that is a responsibility-eluding myth that honest Italian-Americans are stamping out. We don't even like to see the word in print. I can understand honest Italian-Americans feeling that way. But guys like me know the mafia is still with it. We can put the squeeze on marks like you pretty easy. You don't have to tell even a third-generation American about the mafia. Maybe that was the trouble. I had heard too much and for too long. All the stories I ever heard about the Mafia, true or false, build up an unendurable threat. All right, I'll try to help you, Carmen. But, that is, you didn't kill any of these people? He snorted. I haven't killed anybody since early 1943. Please, I said weakly, you needn't incriminate yourself with me. I was in the Marines, Carmen said hotly. Listen, Professor... These aren't no prohibition times. Not many people get made for a hit these days. Mother, most of these bodies they keep ditching at my club haven't been murdered by anybody. They're accident victims. Rum bums with too much antifreeze for summer's day. Spanish-American war vets going to visit Teddy in the natural course of events. Harry Kino just stoles them at my place to embarrass me. Figures to make me lose my liquor license or take a contempt before the grand jury. I don't suppose you could just go to the police. I saw the answer in his eyes. No, I don't suppose you could. I told you once, Professor, but I'll tell you again. I have to get rid of these bodies they keep leaving in my kitchen. I can take them and throw them in the river, sure. But what if me or my boys are stopped en route by some tip badge? Quick lime? I suggested automatically. What are you talking about? Are you sure you're some kind of scientist? Lime doesn't do much to a stiff at all. Kind of purifies them like. I forgot, I admitted. I'd read it in so many stories I'd forgotten it wouldn't work. And I suppose the furnace leaves ashes and there's always traces of hair and teeth in the garbage disposal. An interesting problem at that. I figured you could handle it, Carmen said, leaning back comfortably in the favorite chair of my bachelor apartment. I heard you were working on something to get rid of trash for the government. That, I told him, is restricted information. I subcontracted that work from the big telephone laboratories. How did you find out? Ways, Professor, ways. The government did want me to find a way to dispose of wastes, radioactive wastes. It was the most important problem any country could have in this time of growing atomic industry. 
Now a small-time gangster was asking me to use this research to help him dispose of hot corpses. It made my scientific blood seethe. But the shadow of the black hand cooled it off. Maybe I can find something in that area of research to help you, I said. I'll call you. Don't take too long, Professor, Carmen said cordially. The big drum topped with the metallic coolie's hat had started out as a neutralizer for radioactivity. Now I didn't know what to call it. The AEC had found bearing canisters of hot rubbish in the desert or in the gulf had eventually proved unsatisfactory. Earth tremors or changes of temperature split the tanks in the ground, causing leaks. The undersea containers rusted and corroded through time, poisoning fish and fishermen. Through the SBA, I had been awarded a subcontract to work on the problem. The ideal solution would be to find a way to neutralize radioactive emanations, alpha, beta, X, etc. No, my dear, etc. rays aren't any more dangerous than the rest. But this is easier written than done. Of course, getting energy to destroy energy without producing energy or matter is a violation of the maxim of the conservation of energy. But I didn't let that stop me, any more than I would have let the velocity of light put any limitations on a spacecraft engine I had been engaged to work on. You can't allow other people's ideas to tie you hand and foot. There are some who tell me, however that my refusal to honor such time-tested clichés is why I only have a small private laboratory owned by myself, my late wife's father and the bank, instead of working in the vast facilities of Bell, DuPont, or General Motors. To this, I can only smile and nod. But even refusing to be balked by some conservative ideas, I failed. I could not neutralize radioactivity. All I had been able to do by a basic disturbance in the electromagnetogravitational coordinate system for Earth-Sun, was to reduce the mass of the radioactive matter. This only concentrated the radiations, as in boiling contaminated water. It did make the hot stuff vaguely easier to handle, but it was no breakthrough on the central problem. Now, in the middle of this, I was supposed to find a way to get rid of some damn bodies for Carmen. Pressed for time and knowing the results wouldn't have to be so precise or carefully defined for a racketeer as for the United States government, I began experimenting. I cut corners. I bypassed complete safety circuits. I put dangerous overloads on some transformers and doodled with the wiring diagrams. If I got some kind of passable incinerator, I would be happy. I turned the machine on. The lights popped out. There were changes that should be made before I tried that again, but instead I only found a larger fuse for a heavier load and jammed that in the switch box. I flipped my machine into service once again. The lights flickered and held. The dials on my control board told me the story. It was hard to take. But there it was. Internal scales showed zero. I had had a slightly hot bar of silver alloy inside. It was completely gone. Mass, zero. The temperature gauge showed that there had been no change in centigrade reading that couldn't be explained by the mechanical operation of the machine itself. There had been no sudden discharge of electricity or radioactivity. I checked for a standard anti-gravity effect, but there was none. Gravity inside the cylinder had gone to zero, but never to minus. I was at last violating conservation of energy, not by successfully inverting the cube of the ionization factor, but by destroying mass, by simply making it cease to exist with no cause and side effects. I knew the government wouldn't be interested, since I couldn't explain how my device worked. No amount of successful demonstration could ever convince anybody with any scientific training that it actually did work but I shrewdly judged that Tony Carman wouldn't ask an embarrassing how when he was incapable of understanding the explanation. Yeah, but how does it work? Tony Carman demanded of me, sleeking his mere black hair and staring up at the disc-top drum. Why do you care? I asked irritably. It will dispose of your bodies for you. I got a reason that goes beyond the stiff, 
But let's stick to that just for now. Where are these bodies going? I don't want them ending up in the DA's bathtub. Why not? How could they trace them back to you? You're the scientist, Tony said hotly. I got great respect for those crime lab boys. Maybe the stiff got some of my exclusive brand of talc on it. I don't know. Listen here, Carmen, I said. What makes you think these bodies are going somewhere? Think of it as only a kind of incinerator. Not on your life, Professor. The gadget don't get so hot, so how can it burn? It don't use enough electricity to fry. It don't cut them up or crush them down or dissolve them in acid. I've seen disappearing cabinets before. Mafia or not, I saw red. Are you daring to suggest that I'm working some trick with trap doors or sliding panels? Easy, Professor, Carmen said, effortlessly shoving me back with one palm. I'm not saying you have the machine rigged. It's just that you have to be dropping the stuff through a sliding panel in, well, everything around us. You're sliding all that aside and dropping things through, but I want to know where they wind up. Reasonable? Carmen was an uneducated lout and a criminal, but he had an instinctive feel for the mechanics of physics. I don't know where the stuff goes, Carmen, I finally admitted. It might go to another plane of existence. Another dimension, the writers for the American Weekly would describe it. Or into our past, or our future. The swarthy racketeer pursed his lips and apparently did some rapid calculation. I don't mind the first two but I don't like them going into the future. If they do that, they may show up again in six months. Or six million years. You'll have to cut that future part out, Professor. I was beginning to get a trifle impatient. All those folk tales I'd heard about the Mafia were getting more distant. See here, Carmen. I could lie to you and say they went into the prehistoric past and you would never know the difference. But the truth is... I just don't know where the processed material goes. There's a chance it may go into the future, yes. But unless it goes exactly one year or exactly so many years, it would appear in empty space, because the Earth will have moved from the spot it was transmitted. I don't know for sure. Perhaps the slight Deneb Ward movement of the solar system would wreck a perfect three-point landing even then, and cause the dispatch materials to burn up from atmospheric friction, like meteors. You'll just have to take a chance on the future. That's the best I can do. Carmen inhaled deeply. Okay, I'll risk it. Pretty long odds against any squeal on the play. How many of these things can you turn out, Professor? I can construct a duplicate of this device so that you may destroy the unwanted corpses you would have me believe are delivered to you with the regularity of the morning milk run. The racketeer waved that suggestion aside. I'm talking about a big operation, Vanetti. These things can take the place of incinerators, garbage disposals, waste baskets. Impractical, I snorted. You don't realize the tremendous amount of electrical power these devices require. Nuts! From what you said, the machine is like a TV set. It takes a lot of power to get it started, but then on it coasts on its own generators. There's something to what you say, I admitted in the face of this unexpected information. But I can hardly turn my invention over to your entirely persuasive salesman, I'm sure. This is part of the results of an investigation for the government. Washington will have to decide what to do with the machine. Listen, Professor, Carmen began, the Mafia. What makes you think I'm more afraid of the Mafia than I am of the FBI? I may have already sealed my fate by letting you in on this much. Machine gunning is hardly a less attractive fate to me than a poor security rating. To me, being dead professionally would be as bad as being dead biologically. Tony Carmen laid a heavy hand on my shoulder. I finally deduced he intended to be cordial. Of course, he said smoothly. You have to give this to Washington, but there are ways, Professor. I know. I'm a businessman. You are? I said. He named some of the businesses in which he held large shares of stock. You are. I've had experience in this sort of thing. We simply leak the information to a few hundred well-selected persons about all that your machine can do. 
We'll call them expendables, because they can expend anything. I, I interjected, plan to call it the Venetti machine. Professor, who calls the radio the Marconi these days? There are Geiger-Muller counters, though, I said. You don't have to give a Geiger counter the sex appeal of a TV set or a hard-top convertible. We'll call them expendables. No home will be complete without one. Perfect for disposing of unwanted bodies, I mused. The murder rate will go alarmingly with those devices within easy reach. Did that stop Sam Cold or Henry Ford? Tony Carman asked reasonably. Naturally, I was aware that the government would not be interested in my machine. I am not a Fortean, a psychic, a scientist, or a screwball. But the government frequently gets things it doesn't know what to do with, like airplanes in the twenties. When it doesn't know what to do, it doesn't do it. There have been hundreds of workable perpetual motion machines patented, for example. Of course, they weren't vices in the strictest sense of the word. Many of them used the external power of gravity. They would wear out or slow down in time from friction, but for the meanwhile, for some ten to two hundred years, they would just sit there moving. No one had ever been able to figure out what to do with them. I knew the AEC wasn't going to dump tons of radioactive waste, with some possible future reclamation value, into a machine which they didn't believe actually could work. Tony Carman knew exactly what to do with an expendable once he got his hands on it. Naturally, that was what I had been afraid of. The closed sedan was warm even in early December. Outside, the street was a progression of shadowed block forms. I was shivering slightly, my teeth rattling like the porcelain they were. Was this the storied ride, I wondered. Carmen finally returned to the car, unlatched the door and slid in. He didn't reinsert the ignition key. I didn't feel like sprinting down the deserted street. The boys will have it set up in a minute, Tony the racketeer informed me. What, the firing squad? The expendable, of course. Here, you drag me out here to see how you have prostituted my invention? I presume you've set it up with a Keep Our City Clean sign pasted on it. He chuckled. It was a somewhat nasty sound, or so I imagined. A flashlight wrinkled in the sooty twilight. Okay, let's go, Tony said, slapping my shoulder. I got out of the car, rubbing my flabby bicep. Whenever I took my teenage daughter to the beach from my late wife's parents' home, I frequently found 230-pound bullies did kick sand in my ears. The machine was installed on the corner, half covered with a gloomy white shroud, and fearlessly plugged into the city lighting system via a blanketed street lamp. Two hoods hovered in a doorway, ready to take care of the first cop with a couple of fifties or a single thirty-eight, as necessity dictated. Tony guided my elbow. Okay, Professor, I think I understand the bit now, but I'll let you run it up the flagpole for me, to see how it waves to the national anthem. Here? I sputtered once more. I told you, Carmen, I wanted nothing more to do with you. Your check is still on deposit. You didn't want anything to do with me in the first place. The thug's teeth flashed in the night. Throw your contraption into gear, buddy. This was the first time the tone of respect, even if faked, had gone out of his voice. I moved to the switchboard of my invention. What remained was as simple as adjusting a modern floor lamp to a medium light position. I flipped. Restraining any impulse toward colloquialism, I was so deeply disturbed by what next occurred. One of the massive square shapes on the horizon vanished. What have you done? I yelped, ripping the cover off the machine. Even under the uncertain illumination of the smogged stars, I could see that the unit was half gone. In fact, exactly halved. Squint the Seal is one of my boys. He used to be a mechanic in the old days for Burger Mattel, the guys who used to rob banks and stuff. There was an unmistakable note of boyish admiration in Carmen's voice. He figured the thing would work like that. Separate the poles and you increase the size of the working area. You mean square the operational field. 
Your idiot doesn't even know mechanics. No, but he knows all about how any kind of machine works. You call that working? I demanded. Do you realize what you have here, Carmen? Sure, a disintegrator ray, straight out of startling stories. My opinion as to the type of person who followed the pages of science fiction magazines with fluttering lips and tracing finger was upheld. I looked at the old warehouse and of course didn't see it. What was this test for? I asked, fearful of the Frankenstein I had made. What are you planning to do now? This was no test, Vanetti. This was it. I just wiped out Harry Kino and his inmates right in the middle of their confidential squat. Good heavens! That's uncouthly old-fashioned of you, Carmen. Why, that's murder! Not, Carmen said, without no corpus delecti. The body of the crime remains without the body of the victim, I remembered from my early Ellery Queen training. You're talking too much, Professor, Tony suggested. Remember, you did it with your machine. Yes, I said at length, and why are we standing here letting those machines sit there? There were two small items of interest to me in the Times the following morning. One two-inch story, barely making page one because of the hole to fill at the bottom of an account of the number of the victims of Indian summer heat prostration, told of the incineration of a warehouse on Fleet Street by an ingenious new arson bomb that left virtually no trace. Maybe the fire inspector had planted a few traces to make his explanation more credible. The second item was further over in a science column just off the editorial page. It told of the government, developing a new process of waste disposal rivaling the old Buck Rogers disintegrator ray. This, I presumed, was one of Tony Carman's information leaks. If he hoped to arouse the public into demanding my invention, I doubted he would succeed. The public had been told repeatedly of a new radioactive process for preserving food and a painless way of spraying injections through the skin. But they were still stuck with refrigerators and hypodermic needles. I had forced my way halfway through the paper and the terrible coffee I made when the doorbell rang. I was hardly surprised when it turned out to be Tony Carmen behind the front door. He pushed in, slapping a rolled newspaper in his palm, "'Action, Professor. "'The district attorney has indicted you?' I said hopefully. "'He's not even indicted you, Vanetti. "'No, I got a feeler on this planned in the Times.' "'I shook my head. "'The government will take over the invention, "'no matter what the public wants. "'The public? "'Who cares about the public? "'The Archivox Corporation wants this machine of yours. "'They have their agents tracing the plant now.' They will go from the columnist to his leg man to my man and finally to you. Won't be long before they get here. An hour, maybe. Archivox makes radios and TV sets. What do they want with the expendables? Opening up a new appliance line with real innovations. I hear they got a new refrigerator. All open, just shelves, no doors or sides. They want a revolutionary garbage disposal, too. Do you own stock in the company? Is that how you know? I own stock in a competitor. That's how I know, Carmen informed me. Listen, Professor, you can sell to Acrobox and still keep control of the patents through a separate corporation, and I'll give you 49% of its stock. This was Carmen's idea of a magnanimous offer for my invention. It was a pretty good offer, 49% and my good health. But will the government let Acrovox have the machine for commercial use? The government would let Acrovox have the hydrogen bomb if they found a commercial use for it. There was a sturdy knock on the door, not a shrill ring of the bell. That must be Acrobox now, Carmen growled. They have the best detectives in the business. You know what to tell them? I knew what to tell them. I peeled off my wet shirt and threw it across the corner of my desk, casting a reproving eye at the pastel air conditioner in the window. It wasn't really the machine's fault. The water department reported the reservoir too low to run water-cooled systems. It would be a day or two before I get the gas type into my office. Miss Brown, my secretary, 
was getting a good look at my pale, bony chest. Well, for the salary she got, she could stand to look. Of course, she herself was wearing a modest one-strap sundress, not shorts and halters like some of the girls. My, she observed, it certainly is humid for March, isn't it, Professor Vanetti? I agreed that it was. She got her pad and pencil ready. Wheedling form letter to better mousetraps. Where are our royalties for the last quarter of the year? We know we didn't have a full three months with our expendable field in operation on the new traps, but we want the payola for what we have coming. Condescending form letter to humane lethal equipment. Absolutely do not send the California penal system any chambers equipped with our patent and field until legislature officially approves them. We got away with it in New Mexico, but we're older and wiser now. Rush priority telegram to President, United States, any time in the next ten days. Thanks for citation, etc. Glad Buddy system is working out well in training battlefield disintegrator teams. Indignant form letter to Acrovox. We do not feel we are properly co-respondent in your damage suits. Small children and appliances have always been a problem, viz. ice boxes and refrigerators. Suggest you put a more complicated latch on the handles of the dangerously inferior doors you have covering our efficient patent and field. I leaned back and took a breather. There was no getting around it. I just wasn't happy as a businessman. I had been counting on being only a figurehead in the expendable patent holding corporation, but Tony Carman didn't like office work, and he hadn't anyone he trusted any more than me, even. I jerked open a drawer and pulled off a paper towel from the roll I had stolen in the men's room. Scrubbing my chest and neck with it, I smoothed it out and dropped it into the waste basket. It slid down the tapering sides and through the narrow slot above the expendable field. I had redesigned the waste baskets after Janitor had stepped in one, but Gimpy was happy now, with the fifty thousand dollars we paid him. I opened my mouth, and Miss Brown's pencil perked up its eraser, reflecting her fierce alertness. Tony Carmen banged open the door, and I closed my mouth. G men are on the way here, he blurted, and collapsed into a chair opposite Miss Brown. Don't revert to type, I warned him. What kind of G men? FBI, FCC, CIA, FDA, USTD, investigators for the Atomic Energy Commission. The solemn, conservatively dressed young man in the door touched the edge of his snap brim hat as he said it. Miss Brown, would you mind letting our visitor use your chair? I asked. Not at all, sir, she said dreamily. May I suggest, I said, that we might get more business done if you then removed yourself from the chair first. Miss Brown leaped to her feet with a healthy galvanic response and quit the vicinity with her usual efficiency. Once seated, the AEC man said, I'll get right to the point. You may find this troublesome, gentlemen, but your government intends to confiscate all of the devices using your so-called expendable field and forever bar their manufacture in this country or their importation. You stinking G-men aren't getting away with this, Carmen said ingratiatingly. Ever hear of the mafia? Not much, the young man admitted earnestly, since the FBI finished its deportations a few years back. I cleared my throat. I must admit that the destruction of a multi-billion business is disconcerting before lunch. May we ask why you took this step? The agent inserted a finger between his collar and tie. Have you noticed how unseasonably warm it is? I wondered if you had. You're going to have heat prostration if you keep that suit coat on five minutes more. The young man collapsed back in his chair, loosening the top button of his Ivy League jacket, looking from my naked hide to the gossamer scrap of sport shirt Carmen wore. We have to dress inconspicuously in the service, he panted weakly. I nodded understandingly. What does the heat have to do with the outline of the expendables? At first we thought there might be some truth in the folk nonsense that nuclear tests had something to do with the rising mean temperature of the world, the AEC man said. But our scientists quickly found they weren't to blame. Clever of them. 
Yes, they saw that the widespread use of your machines was responsible for the higher temperature. Your device violates the law of conservation of energy, seemingly. It seemingly destroys matter without creating energy. Actually, he paused dramatically. Actually, your device added the energy it created in destroying matter to the energy potential of the planet in the form of heat. You see what that means? If your devices continue in operation, the main temperature of the earth will rise to the point where we burst into flame. They must be outlawed. I agree, I said reluctantly. Tony Carmen spoke up. No, you don't, Professor. We don't agree to that. I waved his protest aside. I would agree, I said, except that it wouldn't work. Explain the danger to the public. Let them feel the heat rise themselves, and they will hoard expendables against seizure, and continue to use them, until we do burst into flame, as you put it so religiously. Why? the young man demanded. Because expendables are convenient. There is a ban on frivolous use of water due to the dire need. But the police still have to go stop people from watering lawns, and I suspect not a few swimming pools are being filled on the sly. Water is somebody else's worry, so we'll be generating enough heat to turn Eden into hell. Mass psychology isn't my strongest point, the young man said worriedly, but I suspect you may be right. Then, we'll be damned? No, not necessarily, I told him comfortingly. All we have to do is use up the excess energy with the engines of a specific design. But can we design those engines in time? The young man wondered with uncharacteristic gloom. Certainly, I said, practicing the power of positive thinking. Now that your worldwide testing laboratories have confirmed a vague fear of mine, I can easily reverse the field of the expendable device and create a rather low-efficiency engine that consumes the excess energy in our planetary potential. The agent of the AEC, whose name I can never remember, was present along with Tony Carman the night my assistants finished with the work I had outlined. While it was midnight outside, the fluorescence made the scene more visible than sunlight. My desk expendable was a medium-sized drum with a tripod frame with an unturned coolies hat at the bottom. Breathlessly, I closed the switch and the scoop disc began slowly to revolve. Is it my imagination, the agent asked, or is it getting cooler in here? Professor, Carmen gave me a warning nudge. There was now something on the revolving disc. It was a bar of some shiny gray metal. Kill the power, Professor, Carmen said. Can it be, I wondered, that the machine is somehow recreating or drawing back the process material from some other time or dimension? Shut the thing off, Vanetti the racketeer demanded. But too late. There was now a somewhat dead man sitting in the saddle of the turning circle of metal. If Harry Kino had only been sane when he turned up on that merry-go-round in Boston, I feel we would have learned much of immense value on the nature of time and space. As it is, I feel that it is a miscarriage of justice to hold me in connection with the murders I am sure Tony Carmen did commit. I hope this personal account, when published, will end the vicious story supported by the district attorney that it was I who sought Tony Carmen out and offered to dispose of his enemies, and that I sought his financial backing for the exploitation of my invention. This is the true, and only true, account of the development of the machine known as the expendable. I am only sorry, now that the temperature has been standardized once more, that the expendable's antithesis, the disexpendable, is of too low an order of efficiency to be of much value as a power source in these days of nuclear and solar energy. So the world is again stuck with the problem of waste disposal, including all that I dumped before. But as a great American once said, you can't win them all. If you so desire, you may send your generous and fruitful letters towards my upcoming defense in care of this civic-minded publication. End of chapter 6 Do not adjust your sets. You're tuned to Wednesday Wonders on the Mutual Audio Network. 
Tomorrow on Mutual is Thursday Thrillers, our roundup of action, adventure, mystery, crime drama, and thrillers, of course. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of diverse audio tales. Or find the Thursday Thrillers feed in your favorite podcast players. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together. Together.